All right. Thank you for that. Church family, I'm going to be leaving tomorrow. I'll be gone Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and be taking the college to a conference. And then, Lord permit, to come back on Thursday. Brother David Deal will be preaching Wednesday night. David is also going to show his updated, via, uh, updated uh, video. Uh, David is our missionary group uh, here. And, of course, the light group for all, almost all of her life. And our missionaries to Canada. Um, Canada. I don't know where Canada came from, to be honest with you. Panama is what I meant to say. I'll tell you, that's a senior moment. Panama. Anyway, back to where we were. Uh, I'm glad Ben's getting back from Panama, so, so I don't know. But anyway, wherever they're coming from and going from. But anyway, he's going to be here Wednesday night. Church family, um, uh, I don't like missing church, but I want to tell you, missing services here. But, uh, you know, I look back at my life growing up as a preacher's kid, and my dad, even though when he passed away, and that church has been without, the pa- been without a pastor for now almost 14 years, which is not right, and it shouldn't have happened, but it is what it is. But I will say this, when he died, every person kept coming until they died. Now, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to die, I'm just telling you <laughs> that he did something right in teaching them that it was not a matter of who was speaking, it's a matter you go to church. And we would have an awful, weak church if the only reason you came was because I'm here. Because the church is not centered around the pastor. The church is centered around around Christ. So you're coming to church so you can hear the word of God, not a particular person. And again, I appreciate um, the kind thoughts. There's some of you in here I appreciate when you, you know, pastor really missed you at service and that kind of thing. And there's others of you that you're probably happy I'm gone. But anyway, um, but I tell you what, I wouldn't trade heritage for anything in the world and I love this place more than anywhere else and um, but there are times I need to be gone and this is one of them but brother uh, David Deal he'll do a good job and he's in Texas tonight and of course he'll be coming back and be preaching on uh, on Wednesday so make him feel at home college if I can meet with you right after the service about that trip uh, in the conference room for just a moment um church family I'm preaching a message tonight um uh, I preach I want to preach for the Lord once and so uh I, pr- I prefer to preach, just as just me, I prefer to uh, preach textually or expository, however you want to call it, to where we can stay in a passage and work our way down. I am not a topical preacher, at least I don't feel like it. Uh, sometimes topical preaching lends itself to teaching instead of preaching. And, uh, but can I tell you something? Teaching's important too. And uh, tonight, I wanna, uh, I'm not going to try to sit here and bore you. I'm gonna take, I'll take as long as the Lord lets, uh, as long as he wants us to. I feel like that uh, the Lord knows what we need. But I want to talk to you for a moment. I, and then somebody tonight, as soon as I tell you the topic, you're going to say, well, this does not apply to me. All right? But you cannot leave. The service has already started. All right? So it's just the way it is. Okay? So you're going you're gonna to stick it out tonight. And, and so I'm not going to tell you what I'm preaching on. Let's go ahead and pray. And uh, that way you can't leave while I'm praying. All right? You'll at least, be, at least want to stay till after the prayer to know who we're speaking to tonight. All right, so let's pray. Father, again, thank you for letting us be in church tonight, and it is about you. May we always bring glory to you. Thank you for what you do in our life. Lord, again, the thought tonight, like every service, seemingly could be to one person or one group of people, but it's never that way. You said all scripture is profitable, which means it's profitable for us, whether, whether it's our age or whether we're married or not. Father, you have, boy or girl, Lord, you have a purpose for your word. And Lord, may your, your purpose be established and be uh, fulfilled in the hearts of people tonight. We love you. Thank you for this place, these people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 22 with me tonight. Proverbs chapter 22. I want to talk to you for just a little bit. I'm just, again, the title means nothing, but the subject matter is what I want to talk about. I want to talk to you for a little bit. I, I'm just going to call it child rearing one on one. One on one. Now, I know some of you are thinking, I don't have any children, and I'm not married, and I'm, you know, I'm 75 years old. I don't know what your excuse is, but. I want to go through some things tonight that are real just basic things as far as rearing children. When I came to Heritage, we had no children. I was here, uh, we were married seven and a half years before we adopted our first child. We adopted our first, adopted our second. Then the Lord allowed my wife to become pregnant. We started having children, had six more, so we have eight children. And um, our, our home is just uh, different. Uh, I, there's no way to compare our house with your house or vice versa. And it's because of, as a parent, the way we teach as we've been taught, the way we rear children is usually how we've been reared. Um, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of varieties when it comes to children. Think about this. Think about the difference between a, a firstborn and the rest of them. Firstborns have a tendency to be bossy and stubborn. How many firstborn in here? Would you raise your hand? All right. All right. So how many of you that are related to those that raised their hand would agree they are bossy and they are stubborn? The, a firstborn has 
I was, that was a rhetorical statement. You didn't have to raise your hand, all right? But the first, firstborn has a tendency to be that way. And then we always have that thing, well, the, la, the, the last one born. Now, we have age, the first and last. The last one, how many of you would say, you know, the last one is a spoiled, rotten brat? All right, raise your hand. All right, spoiled, rotten brat. Right. Okay, okay, we got that established, too, apparently. So, now, how many would agree that everything in between that are all the spiritual ones? Would you raise your hand? All right. <laughs> Okay, we know where you were born in the lineup, all right? So, so there's a difference when it comes to comparing our families as well as comparing our children, because children are all different. And things that we don't discuss that really have a lot to do with it is, like, for instance, generational sins. Our children have a tendency that they will always have a pull to go toward the th- to the left, to the things that we do wrong, they're going to have a tendency to do those things wrong. If you have a temper, your children have a, te- a tendency to, to have a temper. If you have a, have a problem with money, usually your children are going to have a problem with money. It's just because of generational sin. Some of those things, they don't have to be carried on, but they can be. Another thing that has to do with our children that really changes the dynamics of our homes is the actual spirituality of the individual child. You know, I have some of, some of my kids that they get up on their own with an alarm clock. They get up on their own, and the first thing they do is they go to their Bible and read it. And then I have others that do not do that. <laughs> Alrighty, and uh, uh, my dad growing up, he never, I can't remember one time, never one time did dad say, did you have your devotions today? Never one time did my dad say, where are you reading in your Bible? That didn't never, ever, ever, ever happened, okay? Now, thankfully the Lord did some things in my life when I, I got to be a teenager where Bible reading and scripture memorization came a part of my life, don't even know how it really got started. But I do know this, that it changed my life, and Scripture does that to a person. So if you have a child that has his devotions, whether he knows it or she knows it or not, it's changing their life. So again, the dynamics of our families were not the same, okay? But there's some basic things, that's why I wanted to say one-on-one. It's these are just real elementary things that I want to go over. Now, I've taught before in years gone by, I think it's five or six T's to tr- child rearing. I'm not going to do those tonight. They might overlap a little bit, but I want to give you five C's tonight about to think about as far as child rearing or rearing our children. First one is this. Is, we're going to start in Proverbs 22. Verse number six says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he, uh, he, sh- he will not depart from it. Now think about this. The word train in this particular uh, uh, verse actually means to narrow, all right? So when he says train up a child now we often take the word in scripture being an english word and we put our english meaning to it but there's meanings behind it that obviously the book was written in hebrew before it was translated into english and that hebrew word means to train means to narrow all right now church family when it comes to our children what god's trying to teach us is this is that you cannot say yes every time When he says to narrow, in other words, we're limiting what our children should or even can do. Now, oftentimes, our children want the gate to be wide open. Well, how come I can't do this? Okay, I want to tell you why, because I'm training you. I'm narrowing what you can and cannot do, all right? There's something I'm just not going to allow. Samuel, the other day, he wanted to go skydiving. And to be honest with you, I didn't want him to go skydiving because I don't want to have a funeral. And I've already done that, and I know it's pretty, it can be dangerous, all right? You know, I, when I was uh, 30 and came to the church, I said I wanted to go skydiving, and now I'm 50, and um, a loving church member bought me a ticket to go skydiving. Now, when you buy your pastor a ticket to go skydiving, there's usually an ulterior motive to that. Thank you, Brother Cornwell. All right, so, so I, he bought it, so I did it. I, actually, it was one of those things I wanted to do, but I never anticipated that my son would want to jump out of an airplane, too. How stupid can you be, all right? <laughs> but Samuel's, he's 18, all right? And he's at that place, he's done with high school. So since you're done with high school, go jump out of a plane, die, I could care less. You've already done with high school, go right ahead. You're 18, because 18 is a magical age. And when you become 18, you have all wisdom in life. <laughs> but if, if one of my other children say, I'm going to go skydiving, we're narrowing this. No, you're not skydiving, all right? If you want to jump out of something, you can jump out of the car. You're not jumping out of a plane, all right? All right, so, but as our kids get older, we open the gate. We allow them to make more decisions in their life. But when they're children, we don't just allow them to do whatever they want. We ne- train. We narrow their decisions. That's why we tell them when they're going to get up. We tell them what chores they're going to have. We tell them what kind of education they're going to have. What are we doing? We're training them. We're narrowing their decisions. Now, tonight... 
Let me just go over quickly these five things as far as child rearing. Here's the first one I want you to think out in this first C is this idea of correction. Correct. Now, there's when it comes to our children, and by the way, I think this is probably the number one thing that we need to remember because we're living in a day of, of course, more my era, but really less now. Remember when uh, you that are my age, the big thing was Dr. Dobson and his timeout program. All right. Of course, Dr. Spock, psychologist, he was, you know, don't discipline at all. Then Dr. Dobson, who's a Christian, he was saying, you know, you need this timeout program. And now, I want to tell you something today. You you can't, the the child has his rights according to the law. You know, in in public school, they're going to give them the phone number on who they can call if your parents touch you. And I want to tell you, children, uh, I don't care what the society says. God says very clearly in his book, chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Proverbs 20, verse number 30, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes the inward parts of the belly, all righty? Proverbs 23, verse 13, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Believe me, I challenged that verse when I was a child. I thought I was going to die, but I didn't die. And I had a dad who spanked us, and dad didn't use a paddle. We used a paddle at our home, but he didn't use a paddle. He used the belt, all righty? I want to tell you something. It didn't change the fact I knew my dad loved me, We've got this mentality that if you spank your child, then you don't love your child. That's not true. Not true at all. In fact, Proverbs chapter 13, the Bible says in verse number 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Uh, Now, uh, how many of you came from the old school where your parents spanked you? Raise your hand. All right. They lived. They lived. All right. Now, young people, uh, uh, I find that the less you spank a child, the more uh, tantrum and fearful they become of, of spankings. All right. Uh, you know, my brother and I were in a Christian school and the Christian school we went to, like our Christian school, practiced corporal punishment. And so at the end of the year, like we gave out awards, they gave out a thing called the SWAT award. There used to be a TV program years ago, SWAT, I don't know what it stood for, it was called SWAT. And they had a helmet and it had SWAT across the t- front. And on the night of graduation, they gave out the awards. <clears throat> they said, we're going to, and they, they keep tallies on how many SWATs you got during the year, okay? My, that particular year, my brother got 58 and I got 56. Now, I did not deserve any of mine. <laughs> but my brother, he deserved every one of them, all right? So that year, my brother came up to the front. This is at graduation. And they gave him a war, and they gave him a swat in front of everybody, all right? I know it was terrible. It ruined him for life. He is scarred for life. He has always been mentally off since then. Now, I'm just trying to say that we're living in a day that if you touch your child, they want to say that you're abusing children. I want to tell you what abuse is. Abuse is when you slap them. Abuse is when you're pushing them around. Abuse is when you're, uh, when, when you're not doing what the Bible talks about as far as disciplining them, okay? So when we discipline uh, at our home, we try to go to my bedroom, my wife and I's bedroom. We go in there. I say, now listen, I'm going to explain to you what you did wrong. Then they're going to put their hands upon the bed. I'm going to give them usually three to five swats. I, to be honest with you, dad did not know how to count when I was growing up, okay? I wish he knew how to count, all righty? Now, I limit it to three to five swats. If I get done spanking and I find out that they still do not agree with the discipline and they get smart with me, I say, okay, now we're going to do this again. You're going to get three to five more, all righty? Once that's done, usually by the time, if it takes two times, they, they figure out, I better keep my mouth shut even if I don't agree, all righty? Now, church family, think about this for a second here. Our society's attitude toward police officers and toward teachers is a direct result because of no discipline in the home. Because when you respect mom and dad's authority, then you respect civil authority. When you respect mom and dad's authority, then you respect church authority. God puts authorities in our life. And when you've got a home where mom and dad does not discipline, they don't respect anybody's authority. All right. So again, this idea of correction, how important it is for us to begin to train and to discipline our children. Many of you that have young children that are, are growing up right now, You know, to put an age as far as that, we all know that when your child cries and he's not hungry and your child cries and he doesn't need his diaper changed and that all he's doing it is for attention, then then you you need to be aware of that, okay? You shouldn't let your kid just scream and aggravate everybody, okay? The person he's aggravating is you, okay? 
So what you need to do is you need to discipline your children. And I wouldn't do it with a, this is just, not, I'm just talking personally. I would not do a child, especially a baby or just somebody that's really, really young. But I'm going to tell you, you put a couple swats on his diaper, they're going to figure out, hey, I shouldn't do that. All righty. But again, this idea of discipline has to start when they're young. If you think you're going to start doing it when they're 15 and all of a sudden it's going to, it's going to change them, it won't change them. The verse we read where it says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I'm sorry, Proverbs 13, 24. It talks about, let me read that verse again real quickly to you. It says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. The word betimes means early. Just look it up in the Hebrew. It just means to be be done early. All right, so correction. Number two, and this is going to be direct opposite now. Correction is important. And and let me say that sometimes correction is with with the rod, but sometimes correction is with reproof. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So again, correction can be verbal correction as well as a spanking. Next one is compliment. Compliment. You're already in the book of Proverbs. You want to look at it. It's chapter number 27. Proverbs 27, verse number 21. Proverbs 27, 21 says this. As the fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his, what's the word? All right, to his praise. Okay, so... God uses this illustration about the finding pot and the, for silver and the furnace for gold as the, getting the impurities out of precious metals. When you put gold into a furnace and the heat uh, causes the impurities to rise to the top, it goes along with Proverbs 25, I think verse number 4, take away the dross from the silver and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. So they would heat the, the gold or silver up, the impurities would rise to the top, they would take those impurities off. They would take what they called dross. They would take that off the top so a person could get pure gold or pure silver. So God uses the same illustration when it comes to us giving compliments. And it's not really just to children. It's really to anybody. When he says, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. If you want to bring out the best in a person, compliment them. Now remember, not flattery. Flattery is insincere praise. In other words, there needs to be sincerity with your praise. So next time your child does what they're supposed to, say, hey, thanks for doing that. Say, hey, I noticed that you took care of that without me saying anything. You know, just acknowledging that. You know what that does? It helps your child be what they're supposed to be. It helps them remember, hey, my dad was, my mom, they, they were happy because I got this thing done without them telling me. And it causes them the next time this comes through is for them to make sure that they get it done. You've heard the old adage, and not a Bible verse, but it says you can catch more flies with honey than you can with what? Vinegar, all right? So again, this idea of complimenting and looking at things that you can acknowledge, all right? Hey, listen, parents, we have a tendency to dwell so much on the negative of our children that our children think, I can't do anything right anyway, what does it matter? By the way, your wife's the same way. Maybe your husband's the same way. That if all you dwell on is, you didn't do this right, you didn't do this right, you didn't do this right, you are not going to make them as the, the, what they need to be as a spouse or a child or if it's somebody that you work with. You need to find things that you can compliment in their lives as far as what we're doing right. I have so many pet peeves, as, 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 not as a pastor, but as, as a person, that I have to be really careful. Like, it's so easy for me to pinpoint things that my children are not doing that they should be doing. I, it's part of me. All right, and I'm going to tell you, if you take care of, and I'm not, I'm not the perfect example of what I'm saying here, but if you take care of details in your life, it bleeds over to every area of your life, all right? For instance, if I was to go out and, walk, and open up your car door tonight, what would I find? I'm not, I'm not saying we're doing it, but you know what? If I look inside your car, it tells me a lot about you. I know that sounds crazy, but if you had McDonald's three days ago and the bag is still sitting in the floorboard of your car, you don't take care of details. The Holy Spirit hush is across the auditorium. <laughs> if I go to your house and I go inside your bedroom and it is a wreck, you don't take care of details. Okay, but there are several people in here, your car is either immaculate or it's clean. There's several of you people in here, there's not even a dish in your sink because once you use it, you wash it. There, there's a part, part of you that you, you take care of details. One of the bad things I was telling the church family this morning about my devotion time, that in the mornings, I always walk between the living room and the kitchen. Uh, in the mornings, the kids are all in bed and they're sleeping, so I have that area to walk. But the bad thing about me walking in that area is I start cleaning. I'm not lying to you. 
My, the pillows on, there's four pillows on our couch. We've got one of those rounded couch type things. They have to be equally spaced apart on the couch. Why? Because God wants it that way. <laughs> so it's almost every morning I'm fixing the pillows on the couch and I think my kids mess them out on purpose is what I think they do. Because <laughs> sometimes I come and they're all on a stack. Sometimes I go in there and I can't find the fourth one. Oh, oh. that is wrong. So anyway, because of, because of the mentality of trying to kick their teeth, some of you are like that in the sense that, you know, or, there needs to be order in your life. Okay, now wait a second here. When you're built that way, you'll have a tendency to be really negative with your children instead of positive because this needs fixed, this needs fixed, this needs fixed, this needs fixed. But you've got to get the, you've got to get the mentality, hey, you did that right. Hey, you did that right. You know why? Because complimenting your children, spouse, or whoever it might be will help them as a person. It will help you to see them, again, be what they could be and should be for the Lord. All right, number one. What's the first word as far as child rearing? Correction. Second one? Compliment. Third one? Consistency. Consistency. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 26. Consistency. The Bible says this, Ponder the path of thy feet, let all thy ways be established. All right, now, church family, when this idea of when it, as far as raising our children... You know, isn't it a wonderful thing to be married? Somebody say amen. amen. If it's not wonderful, don't say a word, all right? It's a wonderful thing to be married. You know, God put two people together that are not the same to have children. If God gives us children, and he doesn't always choose to do it, but if he gives us children, he took two people that are not the same, they brought, and God brought you together to be able to raise those children, okay? Now, in, in my wife and I situation, we are different in a lot of areas, but though we are the same in a lot of areas, which is great, it was just great. My wife is more consistent with things than I am, than I am, okay? I have a tendency, again, uh, I, I do like order, but I have a tendency, okay, we got this done, let's go to the next thing. And by the way, when, as a man, because we're very goal-oriented, oriented, when I get this, when we're done with this, then we go to the next thing, okay? God makes us all differently. Our children need consistency. I'm very thankful for my wife because my wife, she helps keep the consistency in our home. All right, as far as, okay, we're going to eat at this particular time. We're going to get up at this particular time. Uh, this, is, this is what's on the schedule next. This is what we're going to do. And by the way, I don't know that that's really anti-biblical when you think about she's supposed to be the guide of the house. So Timothy, Timothy, I think Timothy or Titus, he says that the woman's supposed to guide the house. There needs to be consistency. Ladies, you, you, ought, to be the help, you ought to help your husband in that area. In other words, having order, but yes, but having consistency. Can I tell you, it's important when it comes to our children that the, this time over here, they can do whatever they want, but now you're going to be on their case. You can't do that. And then the next day, okay, you can go ahead and do it this time, but don't do it. No, there needs to be consistency in our life, and our children need that consistency. The Bible says, and I think it's Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, we need to be consistent in our discipline, but also consistent in their schedule and consistent in their life. You know, the one thing I like about school, now whether you, and by the way, if you homeschool, you ought to at least have the two things that are needed, whether it's Christian school or homeschool or any type of schooling, is you have to have schedule and you have to have discipline. You have to have schedule and you have to have discipline. Schedule causes consistency in that young person's life to be able to prepare them for life. Hey, fellas, how many of you guys get to go into work whenever you want to? Now, don't raise your hand, but there might be a couple, but... Okay, a couple of you say, I don't, I'll go whenever I want, okay? But most of the time, you're punching a time clock, and you have to be there according to the boss's schedule, all right? When we have our children with no consistency, what happens is, is they don't have fixed their mind schedule. They don't have, they don't fix their mind. I have to do this because that's what I'm supposed to do on a regular basis. So again, consistency in our life will help as far as raising the children. Next one is this one. The word contact. The word contact. I do want you to turn to this, if you don't mind. If you turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 15 tonight, let me just point out this, this particular uh, thought here. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. Stories of Absalom, you know the story. While you're turning there, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had, con had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. Look at verse 3. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputy of the king to hear thee. 
Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, and every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Verse 5, And it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do obeisance, look at this phrase, verse 5, He put forth his hand and took him and kissed him, and on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now, there's something that's undeniable when it comes to relationships, and that's this idea of touch, all righty? Now, Absalom, basically, he was stealing the kingdom from his father, and how did he do it? He stood at the gate when somebody came. The Bible says he took them, he touched them. Uh, when you look at Proverbs number 7, and it talks about the strange woman as far as, these, the, as, far as them coming together, the Bible says uh, she caught him and kissed him, and then later on says they forced him. There's something that is powerful about touch. Now, we try to keep our boys and girls, our young people, from touching each other because we know where it leads to. And so that's one temptation they don't have to deal with as long as they're not touching each other. Because that's the way God made us. All right. Now, can I tell you when it comes to raising children, there's something powerful about touch. There's something that draws people together. There's something that causes people to be connected. And it doesn't matter if your children are four and five years old and you say, now listen, hold my hand while we cross the street. Or if they're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, there's something about touch. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I try to make it a habit that when I get home, if the kids are around the table, is just to touch them. Now, they know now because of services that there was an ulterior motive uh, to that. I don't like them at all. I just want to do it. So leave me alone. All right, so... So if they're in there, it's not unusual for me to come and put my hand on maybe on their back or maybe put my hand on their shoulder. It's not unusual for, uh, for us, if we're going to a store, one of the kids to be holding my hand. My kids are getting older now. I think my youngest is nine. Am I correct on that? All right. her, her oldest is nine. But anyway, about nine years old. But there's something powerful about touch. Hey, listen, parents, I cannot stress enough. Your, your, parents, your kids ought to know that you love them. And can I tell you how that you show them? You're affectionate. Right? Hey, I know we're living in a warped society, and I'm going to tell you some of the craziest things that have ever happened, but you're not crazy, and you're not warped, because you touch your children in a right manner, again, to show the affection. My father was not a hugger. My father, he never, we never, hold, he never I don't remember, I mean, I'm sure maybe as a kid, maybe, but I don't remember ever him holding our hands. He was very, uh, more truth than mercy, so he was very uh, stern. I knew, he lo- I knew he loved us. I knew, I had, that wasn't even a doubt, okay? But he was not an affectionate person. It wasn't until I w- we were leaving uh, Kansas that my father really, from that point on, every time he saw me, he would give me a hug and say he loved me. But those things didn't happen growing up, all right? Hey, I'm just trying to tell you that you ought to make it a habit of telling your children that you love them, and you ought to make it a habit of touching them. A hug. A, a kiss on the cheek, all right? Now, this is just Scott Hanks. I still don't understand parents kissing their children on the lips. But anyway, that, I've seen a few of that. I just want you to know we don't do that, okay? I kiss one person on the lips, and that's my wife. That's it, all right? So, but my children, it's not unusual for them to kiss me on the cheek before they go to bed, all right? That's, that's not an unusual thing. Again, I think the, effect, the affection uh, part of the thing is very, very important. Now, listen, you children, listen to me tonight. If your parents are not affectionate, help them, all right? This is not being weird, because you give them a hug, and depending on your age, you know, as far as giving your, uh, giving your mom or dad. You know, I tell my kids when they're, when they're getting ready to leave the house as far as for school, did you make your bed? Did you brush your teeth? Did you kiss your mother goodbye? That's just kind of a normal thing, okay? Did you, did you make your bed? Did you brush your teeth? Did you kiss your mother goodbye? And to me, those are important. I mean, kissing your mother is like brushing your teeth. You don't brush your teeth, you're going to have rotten teeth. You don't kiss your mother, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it's rotten, all right? So, <laughs> so again, you, you ought to show some affection and you should uh, touch. I, I don't know uh, how many of you, you know, when you had babies, you don't mind holding that child and, and being affectionate. But I want to tell you, as they get older, they still need you to be affectionate. They still need you to be affectionate. You young people, you stop being embarrassed because, and I don't, again, I know our age, the age thing as you get older. You know, sorry, let's come here for a second here real quick. Here, let me show you something. Come on, hurry up. If you didn't want to be a preacher's kid, you should have done something about it, all right? All right, all right. look how big this kid is. All right, now, I want to, how old are you now, 16? All right, 16 years old, okay? Now, I, I'm going to say something I don't think I've ever said in your presence before. I don't think, okay? So I'm not going to embarrass you, but you are turning red. But anyway, 
Silas is affectionate, all right? And I'm not trying to embarrass tonight, but I want to tell you, illustrate. Silas has always been affectionate. And Silas, I really, I, I don't have any doubt he loves me to a degree. Not now, but he does love me. And, uh, but Silas, uh, when we were in stores and that stuff, Silas would come up and he would hold my hand and we would, we would go, you know, place together. But Silas got to a place in his life where he was as big as me and he's holding my hand and we're walking through the store. And Silas did not think anything about it. And I didn't want to say to him, people are watching two grown men walk through the store holding hands. (laughs) Now you know, all right? But to be honest with you, part of me really, really liked it that my son wanted to hold my hand. And the other part really, really bothered me that people thought I was queer. (laughs) But I want to tell you something. It's like the Lord smote my heart and said, hey, I want to tell you something. There's a lot of kids that would never hold their parents' hand. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Now, can I tell you, there's some of you young people that you've got this mentality that you've got to be you know, a man. It's usually the fellows. I've got to be a man. I want to tell you something. You ought to show some affection to your parents. I'm going to tell you, one of these they're not going to be there for you to show affection to. So if I were you, I would get into practice. There's nothing wrong. Here, hold my hand. I just cannot believe these kids are this big. Get to see them grow up. And if you're, if you're my age, if you had your children grow up, it's just a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, I tease him, but I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm thankful. I'm blessed. Amen. He lets me be dead. And by the way, he's getting to that age now where he, has, he thinks on his own. And sometimes I don't like the way he thinks. <laughs> and I have to tell him, No. And inside, you know, he's getting, he's a, he's a big boy. But I want to tell you something, church family. No matter how much I love him, he's still son. And there's times I have to say no. And, and Mark, you're going to have that problem right now. Those, those kids are little munchkins right now. But one day they're going to be this size and this ugly. Right. Thank you. Thanks for letting me embarrass you. I appreciate it. So touch is important. It's important for us to touch. Kids, before you go to bed at night... Uh, kiss your mother goodnight. If you don't want to kiss your dad, you know, I know it's weird kissing this, you know, this fuzzy cheek thing. But kiss your mom. She's smooth. T- kiss her on the cheek. All right. But uh, show some affection. All right. Show some affection. And by the way, kids, you reap what you sow. One day you're going to have children. All right. And you don't understand right now. But there's not a parent in the room that would not die for you. As you're, if, if you're their child, they would die for you. It's because they love you. You've got to show them that you love them. All right, quickly. First one uh, we need to think about as far as child rearing is what's the word? Correction. Second one. Compliment. Third one. Be consistent. Fourth one. Contact. Last of all, number five, copyable. Be copyable. First Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. The word example in scripture means die mold. The word example in scripture, sometimes it's the word in sample, sometimes the word example. But that word just simply means a dye mold that you can put wax into. You take away the dye and it comes, becomes the form of the mold. Now, to me finish the statement. Your walk talks, your talk talks, but your, your walk talks louder than your talk. Now, if you want your children to turn out for God and do what's right, then get up in the morning and have your devotions. If you want your children to turn out for God and do, do right, be at every church service. If you want your children to turn out for God and do that which is right, then don't be critical. If you want your children to turn out for God and, and do that which is right, then be the example that you want them to be. You know, uh, if I was to say, uh, my dad's in heaven, he's, got the perfect, he's perfect now, but if I was to say that my dad had two faults in his life that I could visibly see and I look back at life, I would say again the first, now again my dad, he was my hero, my friend, I missed him terribly. Many times I want to just pick up, I wish there was some way I could call him. Uh, I, took the, I was up there last month, I don't know what it was for, but I was up there last month, uh, and if I'm anywhere near my dad's grave site, if I'm even near it, I want to go there. I took pictures of his grave site, it was just me. I was by myself for whatever reason. 
And I know it's just his body. I know it's just his shell. But this is, I don't know what it is as a person. It's just the closest I can get to where I think about him. And I feel like he's close. Now he's in heaven. I know that. But, but uh, so my dad, he was, everything, he was everything to me as a young person. I, there was, I, he was my counselor. He was everything to me. So when God took him, that was a big change for me in my life. But if I looked at my dad's life and I said there was two things that really dad um, really had a hard time with, I would say number one, it was dad's temper. And I, I always talk to you about the mercy and truth thing, but his temper, you know, he just, you know, when he got on you, you know, everybody knew within a three mile radius. I mean, it was pretty bad. And uh, that was just the way dad was. And it's not that I didn't know he didn't love me, but man alive, could he, you talk about, my kids the other day, we were in the car, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, one, it was one of my girls and she said, dad, you don't have to be, you don't have to be mad. I said, daughter. You don't know what mad is. <laughs> and I think of my wife, she spoke up and she says, your dad's irritated. And that's different than being mad, all right? You know, anyway. I, sometimes I just wish my kids could have met their grandfather and I could have put them in a room with him for a little bit because they would love me. <laughs> so dad, he had a bad temper. The second thing that dad that I would say that he really struggled with, to be honest with you, I think um, in the idea of uh, food. And just dad, he just ate and he enjoyed eating. And some of you remember my father because he came and preached here. Uh, obviously, he died early in life. He was only 58. But dad was a heavy fellow. And dad had diabetes and several other things wrong with him. But dad liked to eat. And he would eat late at night and eat all things that were not healthy for you, but they sure tasted good. I mean, everything had to be fried and everything had to have grease coming off of it. And if it didn't have grease on, on it, it had to be made with milk because it had to be some type of ice cream or dairy product. And dad just, it just, it just didn't, eat, didn't eat very healthy. And, uh, and I look at my dad's life and I'd say, okay, those two things were things in his life. And, I, and by the, I think our kids do the same thing. I think they consciously know what's wrong. Now, children, God didn't create you to be the critique. God cr- created you to obey mom and dad and honor your mom and dad. All righty? But there's things that we can learn from our parents to say, hey, listen, there's certain things I want to copy and there's certain things I don't want to copy. Are you with me tonight? So as a parent, I want my life to be a life that the kids could copy. And when I'm dead and gone, they're going to stand up and say, yeah, dad had about 75 things that were wrong with him. And they might be able to list them all or list every one of them. But to be honest with you, I'd like to give them some things to copy. All righty. I want them to copy me witnessing to somebody. I want them to copy that dad had his devotions. I want them to copy how he treated his, his, their mother. You know, there's things I want them to be able to copy in my life. And I know I'm not going to be a perfect parent, but I can work at being copyable. You know, I really, uh, I'll I'll finish here, but if I was going to promote anything as a person, you already heard me teach on on the model prayer. But there's something about the Jabez prayer. Bless me indeed, enlarge my coast, that thy hand might be with me, that thou wouldst keep me from evil, that may, may not grieve me. The second one about enlarge my coast means, God, give me more fence, more territory to be able to influence more people. Enlarge my coast. Now, for me, I pray for enlarge my coast in missions as far as knowing what missionaries are churches support, missions and materials. I might be able to write more tracts, books, Sunday school lessons, etc. Um, media is that every message would be what God wanted it to be because there are other people who listen to these messages. All right? So I want God to enlarge my coast. And I go through three or four things and ask the Lord to enlarge me. But you know what part of our enlargement is? It's our children. Kirkland Smith is in heaven, but he has one boy named Ben that's in Africa. He's got another daughter named Delight that's in uh, Canada. (laughs) Delight, are you here? There's Delight back there, okay. So Delight, Panama. Uh, He has uh, uh, a Faith, who's a pastor's wife in Lincoln, um, Nebraska. Uh, he's got several that are here that are faithful to this church that are str- that are, are, are strength that strengthen our church. Uh, Joy, who's been doing secretarial work for now for uh, 55 years, and uh, uh, and then uh, Sarah, who helps out in the college, and then of course Brother Barnabas Smith. I can't go through all the stuff he he helps me with and helps in the church, and and then you've got Sam. Uh, who, again, uh, uh, is, a, is a faithful uh, layman and, again, loyal and helpful in so many different areas. And you've got David Smith, who's on his way uh, to Kenya, uh, Africa. And so uh, Joy and Sarah and um, Joy, Sarah, Barnabas, Faith, Delight, Benjamin, Samuel, David, Melody, and Raw. All of Brother Smith's influence in life, he's in heaven. 
But you know what happened? He was copyable. You know, Brother Smith, when he first came to this church, was not the same Brother Smith you knew. Brother Smith changed over time as far as coming to this church. And he, he had a conviction about church. He had a love for God. And that stuff overflowed to his children. I'm just trying to say, our children, they need something that they can copy. And listen, you all in the service tonight, this, this is not to discourage you because you have a wayward boy, girl, whoever. Can I tell you tonight, they still know that they have a mom and dad that has stayed faithful, and I wouldn't give up hope on them. Amen. I wouldn't just say, well, you know what, they're never coming back. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, you know, God can do whatever he wants inside of a young person's life. But we need to make sure that we stay to be copyable. So tonight, these are the basics. I know there's more that we could talk about tonight. Child rearing one-on-one. Make sure that we have correction. Make sure that you compliment. Make sure that you're consistent. Make sure that you have contact. And make sure that you're copyable. Some things that all of us could put into practice. Not just for our children, but for our, for our marriages. These things are important. Let's go ahead and pray. And we'll ask God's blessing on his word together. Let's all stand to our feet. And again, I'll pray. Take a moment of prayer tonight. Maybe tonight you just need to ask the Lord, Lord, help me be a better parent. Help me, Father, to train these children for you. Father in heaven, would you please again use the words that, we, that were spoken tonight, and of course the scripture that we've read. And Lord, I ask you to please help us all to be better parents. And Lord, I ask you to please help us to see some children that would do mighty things for you uh, because of parental influence and most importantly because of your grace. Father, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God spoke to your heart. You come.